Hey, and welcome back to the cloudchurch.org. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist in Spanish and English speaking people. We've been going through the seven mysteries in the Bible, and we're now to mystery number six Mystery Babylon. Now, of the seven mysteries that I've been presenting to you, six of those mysteries are from the Apostle Paul, and one of them is from the Apostle John. And this is the mystery revealed by God to John the mystery of mystery. Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Let's uh, briefly uh, go back to um, the other mysteries and remind ourselves of what they are. Our first ministry was over here, and it had to do with the uh, mystery of godliness, the birth of Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, and the Trinity. And we talked about that and how when Jesus died, he was buried and rose again and appeared to his apostles. Our second and third ministry had to do with the time period of the church. And our second mystery was when you're saved, the indwelling of the believer, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then our third mystery, we looked at uh, being in Christ, being in the church, what the bride of Christ is, the church. And we looked at how when you're saved, you're part of the body of Christ. Then our fourth mystery was right here. That was the mystery of the rapture. And we looked at the rapture, when the rapture is coming, what the Bible has to say about that, when the bride is caught up. Well, our fifth mystery was what we looked at last time, which was the mystery of iniquity. And it had to do with the Antichrist. And we showed, or I showed, I was the only one teaching, I showed how there is the Antichrist, and the Antichrist will appear in the tribulation. But we also saw how, even from the time of Christ, there was a line down here, maybe I should do that in black, in which there were other antichrists. There were many antichrists. So even though there's one antichrist in the future, out here there are many antichrists. And so we saw how this mystery had to, had to go along here as well, for all throughout the time of the church age there were people who were antichrists. And how do we identify them? Well, they're the ones that said Jesus Christ was not God manifest in the flesh. Now, we're going to get to our sixth mystery here, and the sixth mystery, Mystery Babylon. It also ties in a lot with this fifth mystery of the Antichrist. There will be a one world church in the time of the Antichrist. And that's how the Antichrist will take over the world with his one world religion and his one world government, the new world order. So we have a new world order, but we also have a one world church. I guess I'll just abbreviate that. One World Church, OWC. Well, this mystery that we're going to look at today, just like the mystery of iniquity, isn't just in the future, but it also continues on as well, and has been continuing on since the time of Christ. You see, everything that the Lord does, the devil tries to imitate. So Jesus Christ has his church, his body. So the devil wants to get himself a body. The devil has a church. God has apostles. Well, Satan has what the Bible calls false apostles in 2 Corinthians 11, 13. As God has his gospel, Satan has his own false gospel. Galatians chapter 1, if any man preach unto you any other gospel, let him be accursed. As the Lord Jesus Christ has his minister, so Satan has his ministers in 2 Corinthians 11:15. So, according to the Bible, Satan tries to imitate everything that God does. And we will see that the devil has his own church. And all throughout the church age, well, I guess there's only one way to call it, is Satan's church. I don't know any other word or any other way to explain it. This is God's. And Satan always counterfeits everything that's God's, so this must be Satan's. And so throughout this time, we see Mystery Babylon. Why is this, this called Mystery Babylon? Well, it all ties in way back over here to the kingdom of Babylon. And it's from that kingdom that we find a lot of different things that tie into this. So there's a lot to cover today. I'll go as quickly as I can. I'll hopefully be able to present all this and I hope it's understandable to you. I'm not trying to offend anyone or their religion. I'm just trying to simply explain what does the Bible say about Mystery Babylon, and let's look at the scriptures and see if we can figure out exactly who he or she is, or what it is. So, the word mystery that pertains to this mystery is found in Revelation, and it's Revelation 17.5. That's where we see the word mystery. 
So let's read verse 5 first, and then I want to read the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 17 in context. So Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. So this is Mystery Babylon the Great. And what is she? She's the mother of harlots. So this Mystery Babylon is a whore. Well, think about it. The church, God's church, is called a virgin. It says she's without spot or wrinkle. But the devil's church, if you will, is a whore. And as we'll read, she's full of filthiness and wickedness and, and just pure evil. So the exact opposite of God's church. So this is a whore. The Bible says she's the mother of harlots. What's a harlot? Well, it's the same thing as a whore. But notice that it says harlots, plural. So this mystery isn't just a mystery about one whore. It's also a mystery about a lot of different harlots. So there's more than one. But there is one that's the mother of them all. Who is the mother of harlots? Well, let's go to uh, chapter 17 and read the entire chapter, starting in verse 1, and I'll comment as we go along. Uh, Revelation 17.1, if you have your King James Bible, please read along with us. Revelation 17.1, and we'll read all the way to verse 18. Verse 1 says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. The great whore is who this is. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. She's a great whore. And it says that sitteth upon the, men, the many waters. Well, we'll see in verse 15 what these waters were. But notice that she's a, not just a whore. She's a great whore. <laughs> she's called a great whore. That means she's a really big one. <laughs> She's a really big whore. What is a whore? It's a woman that do anything for money. So a whore ties in with money. Hey, if you'll pay me for it, I'll do it. That's a whore. Well, we're going to see that this whore ties in with religion. And by the way, religion is a racket. Religion is all about this. People ask me all the time, are you religious? I say, oh, no. No, I don't want anything to do with religion. I'm not religious. I'm saved. You see, religion teaches you you've got to do certain things to get to heaven, and it's all works. But salvation teaches you you can't work your way to heaven. Nothing you can do. God doesn't want your money. The only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. And when you give up trusting in yourself and what you do and in your religion and you trust Jesus, that's when you're saved. That's when you get eternal life and when you go to heaven through the gospel. Verse 1 says, That sit upon, sitteth upon the many waters. Verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Well, that's what whores do. They fornicate. And she's drunk. So she's a drunk, fornicating whore. And the Bible says that the kings of the earth have committed in fornication with her. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. So this, this whore is a woman, and she's sitting upon a beast. And it says, full of the names of blasphemy, having, having seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns. Where have we read that before? Well, Daniel talks about some beasts, and in other passages in Revelation, there's the Antichrist, and, and it talks about how he has seven heads and ten horns. So this beast is connected to the whore. Now, is there bestiality involved? I don't know. But if she's a drunken, wicked whore, maybe she's committing bestiality as well. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So she had a golden cup, and she's rich. She has gold and silver and pearls. She's got lots of money. But it says she's full of abominations and filthiness. She's a filthy, wicked whore. There's no other way to talk about her. That's what the Bible says. That's not my opinion. Verse 5 says, Upon her forehead was a name written. So this whore has something written really big on her forehead. And if you have a King James Bible, what's written on her forehead is in all capital letters. It's like she's boasting. Look at me! <laughs> And it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, comma, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So she's not only the mother of harlots, she's the mother of all abominations that are on the earth. What are abominations? Well, bestiality is an abomination. So there are all these abominations that she's connected with. It almost sounds like she has committed fornication not only with men, but with everything that came along. 
Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He was saying, What on earth is this? He couldn't figure it out. This is the Apostle John. Verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So this woman is led about by this monster, this beast. She's sitting on him and riding him. And it says, verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they shall dwell on the earth, shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And we looked at that last time with the mystery of iniquity. Who is the Antichrist? He's the beast. He's the one that dies and comes back to life. So this woman is connected to the Antichrist. She's a whore, and she follows the beast, but she's also, and I'll just put AC, she's connected with the Antichrist. So she somehow ties in with our former mystery. How does she tie in with that? And notice it says that goeth into perdition. The Antichrist is called the son of perdition. Verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Oh, how important is this? Seven mountains. So the seven horns, they say, are seven mountains. And in a minute, we're going to see that this woman is called a city. This woman is connected with the beast, and she's connected with a city. It doesn't sound like a very good woman, does it? Seven heads and seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So she sits upon mountains. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast which that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven. And he goeth unto perdition. Once again, the word perdition. And the Antichrist is called the son of perdition. In verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet. As yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. It doesn't sound like the beast rules for very long. And then it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Now that's Jesus. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So this is a whoremonger. Oh, the beast is a whoremonger, but he's also a warmonger. Interesting. So the beast is connected with this, and we, we looked at last time in our uh, teaching on the Antichrist, how the Antichrist is to make war with God. Well, somehow this Antichrist is tied up with this great whore. So that means the beast is a whoremonger. He's going after the whore. He's a whoremonger, and he's a warmonger. And they want to fight against Jesus Christ. So they're obviously anti-Christ. They're against Jesus Christ, this whore and this beast. And we stop at verse 15. 15 says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth, they are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So she sits on, on seven mountains, but she also sits on nations, and peoples, and tongues. So, so her influence goes upon many nations of the world. So this beast isn't just in one specific place. She rules over so many people throughout the entire world. And it says, verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and shall burn her with fire. So the beast turns on the whore, eventually. For God hath put in, her, in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Somehow she's fulfilling a prophecy with the beast. What was the prophecy? Well, we saw last time in our last mystery, the mystery of iniquity, how the Antichrist has been prophesied shall have seven years to reign in this world with his new world order. And so this woman ties in somehow with the new world order, and I believe that this woman is a religious system that has a one world church. And that one world church worships the Antichrist as though he were God. Now verse um, 18 and here it is. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So that woman is a city. What city could there possibly be that's a city that sits on seven mountains? 
Has there ever been in the history of the world a place that's known as the city of seven mountains or seven hills? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. And that city is the city of Rome. Rome, Italy. The city of Rome. Virgil said of Rome, Rome has been both the most beautiful city in the world and had closed itself with seven high places like a wall. The ancient Propert Propertius said, Rome, the high city of seven mountains that governs the world. Horatius was talking about Rome and how Rome was a pagan city that worshipped gods, false gods. And it says, those gods whose affections have been set in the seven hills. Rome is called the city of seven hills thousands of years ago and to this day. It's known as the city of seven hills. Samasius, introducing a friend from Rome, introduced him as De Septum Montius Verum, the man from the seven mountains, or the seven hills, the man from Rome. You don't have to look far to find that Rome is called the city of seven hills, or seven mountains. Around Rome, there's seven different distinct mountains. If you go to Rome today, you can just turn around in a circle and count all seven of those mountains. So the Bible tells us it's the city of seven hills. Well, who sits in the city of seven hills? Is there a religious organization that's centered in Rome today? Who, who could that be? It's also called a mother. Well, I seem to remember that there is a church in Rome, centered in Rome, and that church is centered at the Vatican. And that church is called the Roman Catholic Church. Huh. Are you saying that Mr. Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying let's look at this from the Bible and see if somehow there's a connection to that. Because there just might be. You know, that church calls itself the Holy Mother Church. Huh. Isn't that interesting? Because the Bible calls Mystery Babylon the Mother of Harlots. Well, Jesus has his church, and nowhere in the Bible is, is the church ever called our mother. So what is, hmm, that's interesting. It's the bride, the bride of Christ, and it's a pure bride. Well, Rome is the seat of the Roman Catholic Church, which they call today the Holy Mother Church. Yet this mother is said to drink on the blood of the saints. Well, if you study this church, you find out there was a thing called the Inquisition. And throughout history in the Inquisition... This church killed literally millions of people. Burned them at the stakes, chopped their head off, tortured them. Could it be that that's who the Bible is talking about? It's also said to be a woman with a cup in her hand. Now, I'll have to put a picture up here as I'm editing this, but when you look at the Vatican and look at the, the, the Pope, there is a money. And on that money, you have Pope Leo the, the sec, uh, the twelfth on the front, and on the back of that, there's a picture of a woman holding a cup, sitting down. Well, that, that sounds like Revelation 17. She sitteth, and she has a cup in her hand. That's interesting. For thousands of years, true Christians have said that this woman was Rome and the Roman Catholic Church. And it's not hard to see why they thought that. But is that true? Is that who this woman is? Well, let's look at some things. Let's look at the fruit. The Bible says, by your fruit you shall know him. Let's look at the Roman Catholic Church, some of the things that it teaches, and let's see if what they teach is what the Bible teaches. And let's see, maybe it's a stretch, but let's see if somehow this ties in with Roman Catholicism, and let's see if somehow this ties in with Babylon. Way back here was the kingdom of Babylon. Is the Bible telling us and warning us of the Roman Catholic Church. A lot of people say, yes, that's what this passage is speaking about. This mystery is not only about her, though, whoever this woman may be, but it's about a false religious system behind this woman. And it says that it's not just her, but that there are many with her. She's the mother of harlots. So she herself is a harlot, but she has many with her. Who are all those as well? Well, first of all, what does the, the Bible teach? Well, the Bible teaches us that the church started with the foundation of Jesus. The Bible tells us to, in 2 Timothy 2.15, to rightly divide, to not be ashamed. And when we rightly divide, we find out that after Jesus, God chose Paul. And Romans 
chapter 11 and verse 13, we find out that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And we are told throughout the Bible that we're supposed to follow the apostle. I wrote apostle in Spanish, my bad. The apostle to the Gentiles. And so he is the one we're supposed to follow. So the books of Romans through Philemon are the books for us today for the church age. Now what does this church teach? Does the church teach that as well, since the Bible teaches that? No. This church over here in Rome says, no, you're supposed to follow Peter. And they say, we follow Peter. If you get a chance, go to cloudchurch.org. Go to past sermons and have a sermon entitled, Paul versus Peter, or Peter versus Paul. I think I have another one there entitled, Paul's Ministry and Peter's Ministry. And you see the difference between Peter and Paul. Today, we are under the ministry of Paul, not Peter. So why does this church try to get us under his ministry? Peter, his ministry was more to Jews, while Paul's ministry is to us Gentiles. Is this a Jewish church? What is this church? that calls itself the Roman Catholic Church. So they say it started with Peter, their church, but yet we find out that the true church started with Jesus and that God gave us the Apostle Paul to reveal unto us certain mysteries that we're to understand and preach today. What does the Bible say about Rome? Okay, let's start there. We know that that city of seven hills is Rome. Does the Bible have anything good to say about Rome? Anything at all? Well, let's look at the Bible itself and see what the Bible says about Rome. Let's start in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. In Matthew chapter 2, I mean, that's a good place to start. Let's just judge all things by the Bible. The Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Well, how do we prove all things? Through the scriptures. So what does the Bible say about Rome? Well, in Matthew 2, 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise man. Who was Herod? He was uh, from Rome. And what did he do? He murdered all the children of Israel from two years old and under. Wow. Rome doesn't sound like a good place if Rome is killing babies. Does the Bible mention Rome again and the Romans? Yes, it does. As a matter of fact, if you study ancient history, the Roman nation was the cruelest most barbaric, just awful nation in the world. They were just bloody. They loved to kill. They might have claimed to be cultural, have culture. <laughs> in, in some ways they were good because they had laws. But Rome was bloodthirsty. Rome killed and killed and killed. And all throughout the Bible we find Rome torturing and murdering and killing. Matthew chapter 27 verse 35. Again we see Rome. Matthew 27, 35, and it says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. Who was that? That was Jesus. And they crucified Jesus. Who killed Jesus? The Romans. You say, no, the Jews did. Yes, the Jews went to the Romans and begged the Romans to kill Jesus. And it was Rome that put Jesus on the cross. And by the way, that T, that's a T. The cross is a T. And that stands for Tammuz, which we'll get to in a minute. Tammuz was a false pagan god. So when those Romans offered up a sacrifice or killed someone on the cross, that was a sacrifice to their false god, Tammuz. They didn't realize that they had killed the true god, Jesus Christ. Well, we've got to Acts now, Acts chapter 12. So here we see Rome is guilty of killing Jesus Christ. Rome doesn't sound like a good place. It seems to me that Rome is guilty of killing babies, guilty of killing our Lord and Savior. And what is Rome? Um, Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. And about that time Herod, a Roman, the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He killed the apostle James, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And then verse 4, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quaternions, Quaternions of soldiers. So, here we have the Romans, the Roman king Herod, killing James and taking Peter and putting him in jail. Are you getting where I'm going with this? The Bible has nothing good to say about Rome. Rome is killing and murdering and imprisoning all the people that are God's people over and over and over again. Acts chapter 16 and verse 23. When they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them in prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who was this? Well, this was Rome, taking the Apostle Paul and beating him and in jailing him. So not only did they 
take a beat up Peter and put him in jail. They did the same with Paul. So Rome does not sound like a great place to center the true church of God because Rome is where they're attacking and killing true Christians. Matter of fact, in uh, Acts chapter 11, I believe it's verse 26, it tells us that the disciples of Christ were first called Christian and, and Christians in Antioch of Syria. It does not say they were first called Christians in Rome. So that's interesting. If you want to look at the history of the early church and where true Christians came from, they didn't come from Rome. They didn't come from Rome. In um, 2 Timothy 4, 6, the Apostle Paul is about to die. And he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. And according to history, we're told that the Apostle Paul was killed by the Romans. I believe they chopped his head off. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 2, look at this. Acts chapter 18 and verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy. That's where Rome is. With his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So, Rome killed Jesus Christ. Rome killed the early apostles. Rome killed the babies when Jesus was born. And then Rome tells all the Jews, you can't stay here, and kicks all the Jews out. Well, the Jews at one time were God's chosen people. The church is God's chosen people. Who is the main enemy of God's chosen people throughout the Bible? It's Rome! So maybe that's why when it talks about the city of seven hills, drunk on the blood of the saints, maybe it's talking about Rome. Because Rome killed the true Christians. In Revelation chapter 1, and verse 9, I won't read it. But that's the Apostle John, the one to whom God revealed this mystery. I'll go ahead and write his name up here. And guess what? John is on the island of Patmos when he writes the book of Revelation. What was Patmos? Well, it was the place that the Romans exiled people that they didn't like. In other words, it was the concentration camp of their day. And what they did is they took John and said, we don't want you. And well, I don't know if it's true or not, but the history teaches that they tried to burn him alive in boiling water. And miraculously, they didn't burn them. So they said, well, we can't kill them, so let's get rid of them. And they put them out on the island of Patmos, a concentration camp, to try to get rid of them. So, does Rome sound like a good place? Now, I didn't read all the scriptures. There's many more. In fact, there's several scriptures that tie Rome into Alexandria, Egypt. And the Bible has nothing good to say about Egypt as well in Alexandria. So why would anyone want to be part of a church or religious system centered in Rome? when the Bible has nothing good at all to say about Rome. Well, Revelation 17 again, in verse 1. There came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And look at verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet. What, what's, what's purple and scarlet? Well, as a matter of fact, purple and scarlet are the colors of the Roman Catholic Church. And their church has a lot of heavy emphasis on a cup. And they call their church the Mother Church. And even in their own coins, they have their church sitting holding a cup. Could there be a connection? there. It's interesting. The more you read it, the closer it looks like it's talking about that area. Well, when did the Roman Catholic Church start? What is the history of the Roman Catholic Church? Well, the Catholic Church says, well, we started with Peter way back here. But when you study history, you find out that's not true. Peter never went to Rome. But according to the Catholic Church, he was the first pope sitting in Rome. Matter of fact, Peter died in, guess where? In Babylon. If you read First and Second Peter, you find out that he's in Babylon, not in Rome. How interesting is that? Well, anyway, the Catholic Church officially started, if you begin to study and read, in 325 A.D. in the Council of Nicaea. So that church didn't start until about 300 years after Jesus with a guy named Constantine. Constantine. And if you look at Constantine and look at the history of Constantine, he was a Roman emperor. And Constantine... Dean, was a Roman emperor who wanted to fight a battle. And he prayed to all the gods and asked them to win. And then he said, well now I'm going to pray to the Christian God and ask him to win. And according to the story, he says that the Christian God appeared unto him 
and gave him this symbol, which, by the way, is the symbol of the Roman Catholic Church to this day. What does that stand for? Well, they say it's the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek. Rho, ek, oh, I can forget what that last letter is. And so they say, see, that was the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, appearing to Constantine. Huh? What if it was this one appearing to Constantine? Well, supposedly Constantine saw a symbol in heaven of a Christ. We don't know if it was Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ Church was already started. It was probably the Antichrist. But uh, he showed up, and he saw this symbol, and he won. And he supposedly heard a voice in heaven say, In hoc vinces, by this you will, you will overcome, or you shall win the battle. And he won a battle, so then he went and he said, Okay, now everybody's got to worship this God, that's the true God. And so he said, Everybody has to be Christian. And so he set up the Roman Catholic religion. And so he chose all these people that claimed to be Christians, and he said, Let's meld Christianity with the state. And they did. Well, a lot of people don't understand, at that time, the state was already melded with pagan gods. So they took this pagan uh, religious state set up and mixed it with Christianity. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church began. And you know what? This guy Constantine, there's no record to this day of him ever being saved. As a matter of fact, he never got baptized. What they did is as soon as he died, they baptized him real quick and said, Oh, he fairly got in. After he died. <laughs> Are you saved by baptism? No. So the whole thing is a religious setup connected with a state. And it doesn't tie in to the true Christians from the time of Christ. And it all goes to Rome. Is Rome where God started his religious system? Where God started the church? No. Jesus died in Jerusalem. The early Christians preached in Jerusalem. Then they went up to Syria, to Antioch, where the disciples of Christ were first called Christians, according to Acts 11.26. So then started the Catholic Church. Now, in about 1500s, way out here, in about the 1500s, there were many people that came out of the Catholic Church. And they called themselves Protestants. And the Catholics say, well, you're, no, you're, you're not old enough. We're older than you. Well, they're only back to 300 after Jesus. No, the true Christians date all the way back to Jesus Christ. So you've got three different groups. You've got the true Church of Christ that started with Jesus. And the Apostle Paul preaching the mysteries God revealed in him. You have a church that started in 325 A.D. through Constantine, a Roman emperor. And then you have the Protestants that, oh, I put them on the wrong line, didn't I? <laughs> the Protestants come out of the Catholic Church. So here's the line of this Catholic Church, and the Protestants came out of this. They got closer to the true Christian church. But sadly, these Protestants are coming back. Many of the Protestants, your Lutherans, your Episcopalians, they're all joining one hands once more and connecting with the Catholic Church. So here is the Catholic Church here. This line represents the Catholic Church of Rome. But yet here's the true Church of Jesus Christ that has always existed. Notice they're two separate lines. Why is that? Well, when you begin to look at the two different doctrines, you find out that these are the doctrines of Christ and Paul, and these are doctrines that came from paganism. You say, are you calling the Catholic Church a pagan church? No, but I am saying that many of the doctrines taught in the Roman Catholic Church come from and have their roots in paganistic practices. There are many, many ways to prove that. But also look at the fruit. All throughout history, there have been true believers in Jesus Christ. They had different names. The Paulicians, the Catharii, the Waldensians, the Albigensians, the Lollards, all existed. And throughout that time period, this church has persecuted and killed them. The Spanish Inquisition took many people and said, unless you believe what our church teaches, you have to be burned at the stake. And they said, no, I believe what the Bible teaches. And they followed and adhered to the Word of God, and they were burned at the stake by the Catholic Church. Many, many, many things we could go into, but look at uh, Revelation 18 and verse 24. Chapter 18 is also speaking about this church. And Revelation 18, 24 says, And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. That's, that's something to say that everyone that was slain upon the earth was slain because of a religious system from Rome. What a thing to say. So she has on her hands the blood of the saints. Now, 
The Catholic Church has different doctrines, and we'll look a little bit at their doctrines. But the Catholic Church, you cannot deny she has killed millions of people. And she has started many wars. This can't be denied. You can't study history without seeing that the Catholic Church has killed countless millions of people throughout history. I worked as a missionary in Honduras for seven years. And when I learned the history of Honduras, I used that to try to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The history of Honduras is not unlike the history of just about every Central American country and the history of Mexico. What happened was the Spaniards, who were very Catholic, came to the New World and they rode together the soldiers and the priests. And the priests came with the Catholic doctrine and the soldiers came with the sword. And in Honduras, the story goes that they came and they told the Indians, you either convert or die. And if you don't convert to Catholicism, we have a sword here, we'll chop your head off. Well, there was a famous hero, Cacique Lempira. Cacique means Indian chief. And Lempira was his name. And Lempira, to this day, is a hero remembered in Honduras because he fought against the Catholic Spaniards who were there to murder them unless they converted to their religion. You go to Honduras today, the money's called Lempiras. Remembering that man who fought against these people that came there with a sword to conquer them. But that's how the Catholic Church has always done it. They've gone with a sword, and they said you either convert or die. Now, where in the Bible does it tell us to do that? It does not. Never, ever did Jesus Christ tell anyone, go preach the gospel, and if they don't accept it, then kill them. Just cut their heads off with a sword. It's not there. But that's how this church has grown by leaps and bounds throughout the ages. Is that grace? Is it, is it grace? The church age is a time of grace. Is that grace? Will you accept Jesus Christ? Yes or no? No. <laughs> Cop your head off. Where's the grace in that? Jesus never told anyone to do that. Jesus said in John 16, 2, that there'll come a time when people will kill you and they think they'll be doing God a service. That's not what God wants. God does not want us to kill. What does Paul say in 2 Timothy 4, 2? Paul tells us to, to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And then he says, with all long suffering and doctrine. Long suffering doesn't mean if they don't accept and become a convert, chop their head off. That's not long suffering. So this church, this false religious system, has a history of going against the Bible. A history of violence, a history of killing and murdering. Well, who are the martyrs? Who are the martyrs? Who are the ones they killed? Well, obviously, many of the Indians they killed who didn't convert. But also, some of the doctrines of the Catholic Church aren't the doctrines of the Bible. For example, the Catholic Church is, believes in infant baptism. What is infant baptism? Well, you take an infant and you allow the priest to sprinkle water on his head. And according to the Catholic Church, that takes away his original sin. But is that in the Bible? No. In none of the 66 books of the King James Bible do you find infant, infant baptism. It's not there. But you go to a Catholic dictionary and look up uh, infant baptism, and guess what it tells you? It has its roots in pagan practice, as the pagans used to do this to their children. Hmm. So that's a pagan practice outside of the teaching of the Bible. Back here, when Constantine mixed paganism and the pagan state religion with Christianity, that became joined with the Christian church. And yet there always existed a true church, and they were known by being a very dogmatically against infant baptism, and they only baptized believers. Well, the Catholic Church believes that salvation is by works. What does the Bible teach? For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by works. So here's the true church preaching grace, salvation by grace through faith, preaching the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your justification, for salvation. And this church says, no, you have to trust us. You have to do what we say. You have to follow our doctrines. Matter of fact, the Catholic Church has known for saying there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. What? So the only way to be saved is through this church from Rome that has on its hands the blood of many people. Uh, I don't think so. Even Peter said there's no salvation, uh, uh, there's no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. So this, this is a cup of blood, the blood of the saints, martyrs who died for Jesus Christ. Why did they die? Well, in the Inquisition, they would kill people, the Catholic Church, unless they would accept infant baptism. 
they would kill people who said, no, I'm saved by faith alone in Jesus and not through the Catholic Church. So we see throughout history, a lot of people say, well, are Roman Catholics Christians? I say, no, because Christians don't kill people in cold blood like this church has done. So Catholicism is a mixture of paganism with Christianity. And one of the things we find out as we look at the Roman Catholic Church, we find that a lot of the things that the Catholic Church does, they go all the way back to Babylon. Hmm, what do you mean they go back to Babylon? Well, way, way back here in Babylon, there was a guy whose name was Nimrod. Let's look at him real quick. There's so much I have to say and so little time to get there, so I'll try to go quickly. But in Genesis chapter 10, we find a man named uh, Nimrod. And Nimrod built a city. And guess what he built? He built the city of Babylon. So how does the Catholic Church tie into Babylon? Well, chapter 10 of Genesis in verse 8. And Cush beget Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or Babel, from where we get the word Babylon. And look at verse 12. And Reason, between Nineveh and Calah, the same is a great city. So this guy Nimrod built Babylon. Huh. So here we have Nimrod, who built Babylon, and the Bible remembers him as a guy who built a great city. And yet way over here, that was the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the last book of the Bible in Revelation, God tells us there's a mystery Babylon, and it's connected with a really big, great city. Huh. I mean, it corresponds. Big city, Babylon. Babylon, great city. Huh. What is this talking about? And it talks about a woman, a filthy woman. Well, back here, as you look through history, you find out that this guy Nimrod was connected to a filthy, wicked woman named Semiramis. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about right now is not in the Bible, but you can get a book called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, and it talks about this. This cannot be denied, what I'm about to tell you. It's all throughout literature. It's all throughout secular teaching. All idol worship began in Babylon. That was the first ones who set up idols and idol worship. You say, why are you talking about idols? Well, this church in Rome, this Roman Catholic church, they have a whole bunch of idols that they worship. You say, well, we don't worship idols. We're Catholic. Really? You can't go into the Catholic church without looking and seeing all these statues. You say, well, those aren't idols. Those aren't idols. What are they? They're images. I've heard them say that. I've told uh, Roman Catholic people before, I said, you guys, you shouldn't worship idols. You've got idols all throughout their church. And they said, they're not idols, they're images. I said, really? They're, they're images? Well, you go to Exodus chapter 20, we, have, we find the Ten Commandments. Which, by the way, the Roman Catholic Church changes the list of the Ten Commandments. They take out the Second Commandment. And they make the Tenth Commandment into two different ones. Why do they do that? Well, if you read... Exodus chapter 20, the second commandment, you'll find out why. The second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And verse 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So you go to the Catholic Church and there's all these images, all these idols. And you say, you're worshiping idols. They say, no, we're not worshiping any images. Well, the Bible says don't worship images. Oh, we're not worshiping them. We're just, uh, we're just adoring them. Oh, yeah, well, let me watch you worship them. And they get down on their knees and they do the little cross sign. What are they doing? They're bowing down to the images. God said no images. So I don't care what they call them. They have disobeyed God by building these things that they worship. When God says not to do that. So you go back to Babylon. In Babylon, there was the great man named Nimrod. Well, Nimrod married Semiramis, and those two had a child, and the child's name was Tammuz. And if you study myth mythology, if you study the ancient writings and all the history, Alexander Hislop's two Babylons, you'll find out that Nimrod was killed. And when Semiramis had a child, Tammuz, she told everyone, this is the resurrected Nimrod. And she built idols. Now, I'm not an artist, so please forgive me if this isn't 
a very good looking uh, representation but what you have this is a woman sitting down and once again I'm not a good artist but the idols the first idols in recorded history came from Babylon and they were idols of a woman with her baby and she's giving suck to that baby well the woman is Semiramis and the child is Tammuz and from Babylon around the world spread the pagan religion of idol worship of a woman and her child you look at Egypt it's Isis and Horus you look around the world you look in Africa you look everywhere you go you'll find the pagans were worshiping idols and they were always worshiping a woman with her child well as the Catholic Church grew they mixed that ancient pagan worship of idols of a woman with child and all they did was just change the names no longer was it Isis and Horus no longer was it Sibeli and her her child Jupiter or whatever his name was no longer was it uh, Semiramis and Nimrod they said oh from now on this is Mary and from now on this is Jesus same idols just change the name to make it sound Christian and all throughout history as the Catholics went forth in their Catholic missionary journeys they they come into these places and they find idols and it was a woman with her child and they say oh great you already believe in Mary and Jesus and the pagans would say who and they said you know our God's names are this and they said no no that's Mary and that's Jesus and let me tell you about them and they continued to worship the exact same idols that they worshiped before it just changed the name so you see the connection from Babylon to mystery Babylon that ancient idol worship and how this Babylon of Rome worships as well their own idols. A lot of idol worship in the Catholic Church. They say, we don't worship idols. Oh, really? What are the images? Okay, Exodus chapter 20. The Bible says don't make any images. So you're sinning against God in the Bible. Now you go to Jeremiah chapter 7 and Jeremiah chapter 44, and you'll find out the Bible talks about the Queen of Heaven. Way back before the birth of Jesus, these people of Israel rebelled against God and they went into the pagans and they began to worship the pagans and the pagans when they worshiped this this woman Semiramis they called her the Queen of Heaven well if you go to a Catholic Church today guess what they'll tell you is the title of Mary they say Mary is the Queen of Heaven did they get that from the Bible is there anywhere in the Bible in the New Testament where it says to worship Mary and call her the Queen of Heaven no there are verses in the Old Testament that tell you there's a pagan idol that has been worshipped by the pagans and they call their worship, the one they worship, the Queen of Heaven. Now if you look at Babylon, you find some interesting things. In Babylon, this Nimrod, he realized, I need to find a way where I can rule over people and I need to find a way where I can, can keep them in submission to me. So he was the first one to start his own religion. And in his religion, they did several things. They worshipped the sun. And so they baked cookies in the, in the shape of a sun, and they, and they started what they called the worship of, of the sun, and they would do drink offerings, and they would eat the cookie, and they would worship their sun god. Well, that almost sounds like what Mystery Babylon in Rome does when they do the Roman Catholic Mass. When you look at that wafer, the hostia, usually it's kept in something that looks like a sun, and they pull it out and they eat it and they do drink offerings. It all ties back to what was done in Babylon. And what's interesting, and this is, this is really interesting, is that when they do that, they say, this wafer is our God and we're really eating our God. That's what they were taught in ancient Babylon is, this is really our God. Well, you go to the Catholic Church, what do they teach? Transubstantiationism, where when you're eating the host, the hostia in Spanish, when you go to the Mass, they say you're literally eating your God. Is that in the Bible? No. Now there's a verse in John 6 where, where God says, you know, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. But then he tells you several verses later, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I say to you, they're spirit and life. Jesus Christ is saying, look, as you eat bread and drink drink, as that, spiritually you must eat and drink me by faith. And as you take that into your belly, when you trust me by faith, I come into you and dwell in you. It's a spiritual thing that Jesus was talking about because he says the flesh and, the, and the, it means nothing. So they took a pagan, pagan practice and applied it to Christianity. 
and it's called the mess. I'm excuse, excuse me, the mass. There were many other things that they did in ancient Babylon. One of the things they did was they started up a, a, a thing in which they had priests, and people had to come to the priest and confess their sins. And then the priest would say, well, I forgive you. To this day, there's the Church of Rome, and what do they do? They say, come to confession, and sit here and tell me all you've ever done. Oh, they wouldn't hold that over you, would they? Oh, no. And then when you're done confessing, what do they say? Te absuelvo de todos tus pecados. I forgive you of all your sins. When Jesus was on the earth, Jesus forgave somebody. And you know what the priest said? They said, who can forgive sins but God only? <laughs> no man can forgive another man's sin. Forgiveness of sins comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. There's no forgiveness of sins through a man forgiving another man. How can one sinful man forgive another sinful man? So many of those teachings and the practices of the Catholic Church that are today, we clearly see they came directly from Babylon. And they were mixed in the pagan religion through Constantine with Christianity. So the names of the pagan gods of the idols were mixed to the names of Jesus and Mary. But yet the same practices, the Mass, the same practices, confession. What about the Pope? Well, the Pope in the, is today still known as the Pontifus Maximus. Do you realize that the term Pontifus Maximus goes all the way back to Babylon? As a matter of fact, the Pontifus was the name of one of the priests in the Babylonian religion. And yet the Catholics still keep that name. In fact, they still have the hat. If you look at the hat of the Pope, it looks like this. If you look from the side, it almost looks like a fish. <laughs> and in the pagan religions, they worship Dagon, who was the fish god, and he wore that type of hat. You, it doesn't, you can't look far without seeing the paganism back here from Babylon mixed in with the paganism of the Roman religion of today. It's right there. Now I'm going to give you something that might scare you, and if it does, great. <laughs> but uh, the Pope has a hat that he wears. There's about five different hats that the Pope wears. And one of them kind of looks like this. It's kind of a, 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 a big beehive-looking hat. And if you look at the ancient Babylonians, that's the exact same, exact same hat they used to wear. But on one of the hats that the Pope wears, there is some words in Latin. And what the Pope's hat says... One of the popes wears a hat. Now watch this. You're not going to believe me. That's why I'm putting it up here. The pope wears a hat in Rome that says Vicarius Philly D. Vicar of Christ, or in the place of God. So the pope has this hat that kind of looks like a beehive that he wears. And in Latin are these words, Vicarius Philly D. Now if you take those words and put them into Roman numerals, you find something very, very surprising. The number L is 50. The number D is 500. The number V is 5. The number C is 100. 500 and 100 is 600. 50 and 10 is 660. That's 660. Now every time there's an I, an I means 1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh my goodness. That in Roman numerals is 666. <laughs> so you take the Pope's hat, which by the way is an exact replica of a hat that these Babylonian priests used to wear, and you look at the Latin inscription on the hat of the Pope, it says Vicarius Philly D. In place of God, in, in, the, in the place of God, a vicar of Christ. And you total that up in Roman numerals, and it says 666. I vaguely remember in the Bible a passage that talks about the Antichrist, and it says in his head he has the names of blasphemy. Well, it's pretty blasphemous to say you are here and you are God on earth, because that's basically what he's saying, I'm God here on this earth. But it's also awful to have those numbers on your hat. The Pope also says, call me Holy Father. What? Holy Father? Matthew 23, 9 tells us, call no man on earth your father. And it's in the context of a religion. And in John 17, 11, Jesus Christ is praying to God the Father, and he says, Holy Father. So that's a title of God the Father, not a title of a man here on earth. There's just so many things that when you look at, you find out, wow, the Roman Catholic Church is kind of scary. 
that's kind of scary right there. And look at the blood in her hands. Now, there was a guy named Malachi. Now, this is kind of interesting. This is just, I don't believe this per se. But back here in about 1100 A.D., there was a guy named Malachi. Malachi was a Catholic. Malachi said that he had a prophecy given to him. And in his day, 1100 after Christ, he said the prophecy given to him was of the next 112 popes. And he wrote down all the next 112 popes. And this Catholic, Malachi, who said he had a vision from God, said that the 112th Pope will be the Antichrist. Now, I can't make this stuff up. You ask any Catholic, they'll tell you, yeah, I've heard of the prophecy of Malachi. Well, Malachi said himself that the last Pope will be the Antichrist. What a thing. I've just been showing you Bible verses and showing you history and saying, wow, the Bible warns us about this religion, and it looks like this religion ties into Rome and ties into Babylon, so it looks like the Bible's talking about the Roman Catholic Church. And you say, well, I'm a Catholic, and I don't accept that. Okay, how about Malachi, who's a Roman Catholic, from your own church? Do you accept what he says? He said the very last pope will be the Antichrist. <laughs> what about that? What about that? Well, guess what? Guess what this last pope was? The last pope who stepped down was the 111th pope. That means this new pope that's there now from Argentina, I don't even remember his name, this guy said he'll be called Pope Romanus, once again connecting him to Rome. Well, that's who's in office right now in that church. The 112th Pope, the Pope that Malachi said would be the Antichrist. Whew. You want to know something even more weird? That Pope was a Jesuit. I don't know if you know what a Jesuit is, but the Jesuit is an order of Catholics. And the Jesuits were started way back in the 1400s as a militant arm of Catholicism. And they wanted to combat these Protestants over here. So the Catholic Church started these Jesuits, and they were to fight against the Protestants to try to get the Protestants back into the Catholic Church. Now, there's one Pope in Rome, and he wears white, and they call him the White Pope. But after the Jesuit order was started, they, they elected a pope that they called the Black Pope. And the Black Pope is really the guy that gave orders to the White Pope. The one you see dressed in white is the one they call the Pope. But he actually had one higher than him, above him, called the Black Pope that told him what to do. Now this current Catholic Pope is a Jesuit. And he was, before he became the White Pope, he was the Black Pope. This is the first time ever that a pope was ever a Jesuit, who was also the black pope. Now, what do you know about Jesuits? I'm going to read you something here. Here is the vow, or the oath, that you have to take to become a Jesuit. It's called the Jesuit Extreme Oath of Induction. So let's say you're a Catholic and you want to become a Catholic uh, Jesuit. You have to take this oath. Now, it's very long, so I'm just going to read a part, part of it. But it says, I furthermore promise and declare that I, and in your name, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics. What did we read over in Revelation that they will make war with the Lamb? But here we find an order within this church that wants to make war. And when they make war, what will they do? It says, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to. Now listen to this oath that you have to take to be a Jesuit. To extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth. And I will spare neither age, sex, or condition. And that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics. Rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable, their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, interesting, and the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whomever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith and of the Society of Jesus. Does that sound like a Christian religion to you? They want to make war. They want to kill. And the Bible says that that church is guilty 
of the blood of the saints. Interesting. Matter of fact, uh, Chick Tracks publishes something in which they say that it was a Jesuit that killed Abraham Lincoln. Now the rest of this here, look what it says. In confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all my corporate powers, and with this dagger which I now receive, I will subscribe my name written in my own blood, in testimony thereof, and should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brother and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet, and my throat from ear to ear, my belly open and sulfur burned therein, and all the punishment that can be afflicted on me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. <laughs> Would you ever take an oath like that? That's sick! And their oath is, we will make war and kill as many people as we can that don't agree with us and what we teach. And then we take a dagger, we cut ourselves, and we write our, we sign in our own blood this oath. I seem to remember people that were Satanists that say that when the devil appears into you to sign your soul away, he says, sign it in your own blood. Once again, we have a connection with Rome. That's a little bit scary. So, Revelation 17 again, in verse 14. Look what the Bible says about this false mystery religion, Mystery Babylon the Great. It says, and these shall make war with the Lamb. We just read that the Jesuits want to make war with the saints of God. Interesting. There's just so much here, man. So what does the Bible say will be the end of this religious system? I, I've got so many other things I could continue talking about. We're already at an hour, so I've got to hurry up and finish this up. But let me just mention real quick the Mass. I've just I got to throw this in here. The Mass. What is the Mass? The Roman Catholic Mass. Because Catholics say that the Mass is a sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They say every time that they do the Mass, they are killing Jesus. And they say they have the power through transubstantiation to believe literally pull Jesus down from heaven and put him in that cup. Put his blood in that cup and put him in that wafer. So they say that they do a sacrifice over and over and over every time they do the Mass. Matter of fact, what are they saying? They're priests who claim to be from Rome who say they are killing Jesus over and over. Who killed Jesus? The priest, the Jewish priest, and they chose Rome to do it. Over here you have a false religious system, Babylon, that takes priests and those priests claim, oh, we're from Rome, and we can take Jesus down from heaven anytime we want. We can kill him over and over and over. And they say that sacrifice has to be done to forgive your sins. How many times did Jesus die? Well, according to them, anytime they want to, they can kill Jesus Christ. But let me read you a verse real quick, and then we'll move on about the Mass. That's why I called it irreverently the mess earlier. Because according to the Bible... In Hebrews chapter 10, you cannot have your sins forgiven by a mass, nor can Jesus be sacrificed more than one time. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 12 say, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he has offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God. So which is true? Do you believe the Bible? Or do you believe this religion? This religion says every time you do the Mass, it forgives your sins. Because they literally sacrifice Jesus again and again and again. But the Bible says no. One sacrifice forever. Jesus sat down on the right hand of God. He's not getting up and jumping down here and going back and going to be sacrificed over and over. It's one sacrifice for all sins forever. The cross of Calvary. Jesus did it. He paid it all. But yet priests who killed Jesus and used Romans to do it, today want to brag about being Roman Catholics, and they claim that their priests can continue to sacrifice Jesus over and over and over. Who is this false religious system? Who is this denomination who does all of this? Let's look at Revelation chapter 18. This is what God says about Mystery Babylon. Do, do you see the connection? Babylon, Mystery Religion. The first pagan religion in history through Nimrod and idol worship. And yet we see that same religion today doing many of the same practices that were invented back then. So, in chapter 18, it tells us what will happen to this mystery Babylon, this one world religion under the Antichrist. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lighted with his glory. 
And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of the devils, and a hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Behind every idol is a demon. Better watch out for these images. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath for fornication. The kings of earth have communicated fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. You say, well, the Catholic Church isn't rich. They have a bow of poverty. Are you kidding me? The Roman Catholic Pope wears robes that have gold intertwined with them. Real 24 karat gold strands. If you have a credit card, and it's a Visa card, guess what? You have a card that stands for Vatican International Sales Association. The richest organization on earth today is the Vatican. Almost all the world's gold has been shipped, and it's underneath the Vatican. And the Vatican has set up its own credit card company, the Vatican International Sales Association, Visa. Well, there it is. There's the money. And it says that the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. If you're a part of this false denominational uh, church, God says, Come out of her, because God's going to judge her for what she's done. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath gloriously glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow, queen of heaven. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, and death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall utterly be burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God, who judges her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication, and lived del deliciously with her, shall bewail her, and lament for her, when thou shalt see the smoke of her burning. And it continues and it tells you more and more and more what happened to that great city. God is going to judge that city on seven hills someday. Because she has murdered and she has on her the blood of the saints. Because there are people in there that have names of blasphemy on their foreheads claiming that they are God. Because they claim you can only be saved through our church. And they try to tell you that the church saves when the Bible tells us, no, 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 Jesus saves. Now, how does this mystery tie in with mystery number five, the mystery of iniquity? Well, this church that has existed back here that was a mixture of the paganism, that church is going to get all the people together and set a new world religion. And that one world church will point everyone to the Antichrist. The United Nations today is, is trying to get everyone together in a new world order, but also with a one world religion. There's a thing today called ecumenicalism in which they're trying to say, no, the Catholic Church is fine. They believe what we do. Let's just all join together. And so these Protestants that came out of the church, they say, just come back in. And there's a great push in the world today to get all religions together into one. Even the Islam. Matter of fact, I don't know if you believe it or not, but according to what I've studied, Islam was started by the Catholic Church. Muhammad married a woman who was Catholic, and she told him a lot of things, and so he mixed a lot of that Catholicism into his religion that he began to start. And now we're starting to see Islam joining with the Catholic Church. So there are many, many, many things I could say more about this, but I have tried from the Bible to show you what the Bible says about Mystery Babylon. And it's clear that that is a religious system that sits on seven hills, and that religious system that sits on heaven hills, the only one is Rome, because Rome is the city of seven hills. And that religious system is a system that is drunk with the blood of the saints. She is fornicated with the kings of the earth. Why? You can't study history without seeing that that church has always, when it took over a country, joined itself with the state. And it has set up kings. And it has put down kings. There's stories of kings that were so scared of the Pope, they'd walk through the snow barefoot to see the Pope to beg for his forgiveness. That religious system has set itself up on this earth and told people there's only one way to come to God, and it's through us and through our church. And they say there's no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, it's about time you learn the truth. There is salvation outside of that religious church. 
And that salvation is through Jesus Christ. We're not saved by a mother. We're saved by Jesus Christ and no other. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, and I always try to put this up here, is the gospel. If you're watching this today and you're not saved, this is to tell you how to be saved. Because you can't be saved in that religion. You know what? If you're a Catholic and you want to be saved, you go to the Catholic priest, what do I do to be saved? He says, well, go to Mass and give money and go to confession. And he'll say, do all these things. And you say, great, when I die, will I go to heaven? He'll say, no. Well, what do I do to go to heaven? And the Catholic priest will say, well, you, you can't do anything, just do good. Yeah, but what happens when I die? You know what he'll say? You go to purgatory and burn. So you do everything you possibly can according to that church, and you still don't even go to heaven. You've got to go burn in purgatory. And you know what they teach? They teach that you have to pay for the mass, and the more masses you do, the faster a person's soul will get out of purgatory. Well, what if you're the very last person who ever died? And there's nobody left after you to pray you out of purgatory. Are you going to be in there forever? <laughs> That's not what the Bible teaches. It says there's heaven, there's hell. That's it. There's nothing in between. You either die and go to hell for all eternity, or you die and go to heaven for all eternity. How do you get to heaven? 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 tells us the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and where you stand, by which also you are saved. You're only saved through the gospel. It says, What I preached unto you, unless you believe in vain, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All that Jesus did was to pay for your sins. You can't pay for your sins in this life. You have to trust Him who loved you enough to die for your sins. And that's how you're saved by coming to Christ and Christ alone. We're not saved by a church. We're saved by Christ Jesus, who died for His church. So I hope this has been a blessing to you. There's so many other things that I'd like to say, but as quickly as I could, I tried to present the truth about the sixth mystery. And it's an interesting mystery, and it ties in with Mystery 5 so well. Because all throughout history, we see that false pagan religion killing true Christians that believed only in Christ. And what was their sin? Choosing not to follow a church, but choosing only to follow Jesus Christ. That church is drunk with the blood of the saints. Come out from among her, my people, the Bible says. Thank you for listening. I hope this will be a blessing. Join us next week for our last and final of the seven mysteries. And we'll look at the mystery of the restoration of Israel. And how God will go back to dealing with the Jews. Thanks again and God bless.